So the first couple weeks of this course are going to be spent on image processing. So for this very first lecture, all I wanted to do is go through the basics of how you work with images in the language Julia. Now the slides that I'm going through here aren't actual normal slides. We're working in what's known as a Pluto notebook. So at any given point, you can you know type code and then um, the output of that code is displayed in some way. Um, this makes it really nice to work with images. And in principle, with these lectures, you can follow along if you want and basically go through the same code and maybe change the inputs or tweak it if you want to explore anything. There are some fun things that we can do with Pluto Notebooks, like um, embed a little webcam uh, applet in here, I guess. And so I can take my picture and we can use the output of that picture as a variable. So in this cell, for example, I'm defining the variable grant to be uh, something which basically takes in the data that that webcam recorded um, and it's going to treat it as a variable. And one thing that you will do in this first week's problem set is write a function that lets you actually detect the edges in an image, which is pretty cool. So you can put in your own image and it's going to find where in that image all of the edges are. Very useful in a lot of scientific applications. But before any of that, let's back up to the basics in thinking about what exactly an image is. Whenever we work with images in computers, and I'm guessing a lot of you are well familiar with this, it's essentially a grid of pixels. So if I pull up some kind of image, like um, a picture of my cat wearing a bow tie, because why not? Uh, if you were to take this image and you were to zoom in, maybe we zoom in onto this sallow eye of Sauron, nice and far, you see that eventually you just get little squares and each square is a single color. So somewhere in that computer, it's representing each of these squares um, as some data type to represent the color, and then it's creating a big grid of them. You often think of indexing into this array from the upper left corner, by the way. So for example, a first index might tell you how far down to walk, and then a second index would tell you how far in to go to get to a certain point. So to start doing this with Julia, let's just get our hands on a specific image. Here we can see some of the boilerplate for if you want to pull an image from the web. So I'm defining a variable URL, which is simply a string. Uh, like in any other language, we use double quotation marks to denote the string. This is gonna pull a specific image. Um, it's gonna be of Philip the Corgi. And this next line downloads whatever's sitting in that URL and it's gonna save it locally on my machine as philip.jpg. And then in this next cell, I'm gonna start using the images library. So the syntax for bringing in a lot of functionality from some other library is using here. And then I might uh, define a variable called Philip to be load and then the name of this file that's now in my system. Um, but whenever we have multiple lines going on like this in a Pluto notebook, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it around a begin end block. And now when I run this, it's going to display whatever it finds from this last line, which in this case is going to be um, something that's an image, Philip. So that's kind of nice that the notebook knows that if I uh, just have an object like Philip, that rather than displaying, you know, the raw underlying data of it, that probably what I want is to see the image itself. Um, but maybe we actually want to know a little bit more about the raw underlying data for something like this. So I could type something like type of Philip, and this is going to give me a type. Okay, so this is a little bit confusing at first uh, for the first time you've seen it, but essentially it's telling us that this variable is something that's of type array, and this two is telling us it's a two-dimensional array. So a one-dimensional array would just be a list of values, a two-dimensional array is a grid of values, and then the type for each one of those values is this RGBX thing. So RGB stands for red, green, blue. This is a very standard way to uh, describe colors in a computer. You have three different numbers telling you how much red, how much green, how much blue is there. If you're wondering what that X means, I would say don't worry about it too much right now. It's just a matter of some padding that can make internal data representations nice. But if you wanted to play with this type, you could type something like RGBX um, and then type in a couple potential values for the red, the green, and the blue, which are gonna be um, each between zero and one. So if I type this, it actually gives me the color that those three values correspond to. And if maybe I increase the G part, increase the green part, um, I get an even greener image. But if I increase the red part, you know, I would get an even redder image. Here it's a blend of red and green. And if I turn down the others, you know, we see something that's very much red. So that's the basic type. And this variable fill up that we have is an array of a whole bunch of those, as you might expect with an image. We could also ask about the size of Philip um, that gives us the dimensions. So in this case, it's telling us uh, 3,675, 2,988. You might wonder which one of those is the height, which one of those is the width. 
And we can basically just tell by taking a look at Philip himself and noticing that it's an image that's much taller than it is wide. So that would suggest that this first variable is giving us the height and the second one is giving us the width, which indeed it is. We can index directly into that array if we want to. So if I did Philip and then I want to go to the 100th pixel down uh, from the top left and then the 400th pixel in from the left, it will return for us uh, something that's an RGB type. So if I asked what's the type of this thing that it returned, it's an RGB object. But when uh, the Pluto notebook just sees that, it thinks that what we want to see is the color, which more often than not, we probably do. So in this case, it looks like I pulled out something that's black from that upper left, but maybe if I'd gone down a lot farther, you know, a thousand down, um, we're getting some blue part. So maybe that was coming somewhere from the rug. We can also slice into this image where let's say I wanted to go from the first pixel up to the 1000th pixel, and then from the first pixel into the 400th pixel, something like that. What this will return is another array. Okay, it's an array that's basically a subset of the original picture. So here it's just going from the upper left down by 1000 and in by 400, which matches with what we see here. Uh, but that's, you know, maybe the least interesting part of the picture. So maybe we want to do something like pull out the cute Corgi himself. And so here I have um, a predefined block that does that for us. Basically, I take a look at the size, um, the height and the width, which I'm writing down as HW equals the size of Philip. And then we're going to pull out, just slice out a specific part of the array. And here I'm going from halfway down the image. So half of height all the way up to height itself. And here, by the way, we're using this... Um, division symbol. So if in Julia you type basically anything from LaTeX um, and then you with a backslash, so like div and then I press tab, it lets us use more symbols than you usually can in code. Because the spirit is that you want the code to read a lot like math. So if I'm typing, you know, like a nabla, this upside down triangle symbol, then I don't have to define that as a variable name or various things like that. But in this case, when we use that division symbol, what it's doing is integer division. So it takes the height and divides by two, but makes sure to keep it of type integer. So it's taking that bottom half of the image and then the width is going from a tenth of the way into it until nine tenths of the way into it. And we're defining that as head. So now if I ask for, you know, what's the size of head, we can see that it's something smaller. And in fact, if we compare it to the size of Philip, we see that, you know, the first dimension is about half and then the next dimension is, well, it should be about 80%, which it is. So that's all well and good. This is how we can slice into arrays to pull out specific subsets. Another nice thing we can do is concatenate arrays together. So if I type open bracket and then this head image that I had and then space and then another copy of that head image with a close bracket, what we get is an array that just sort of smashes the two together. So if I were to ask for the, uh, you know, the type of this object, it's the same type, it's an array um, with these RGB values. If I were to ask for its size, we see that it's actually much wider, about twice as wide, which is what you would expect. Um, but again, it displays it to us really nicely. We could do some fun things with concatenation, like creating a kaleidoscopic corgi. So what we have here is basically four different concatenated images, um, where in the upper left, we have head. And in the upper right, what I've done is reversed head along the second dimension. So if I had just typed head in there, then that upper right image would be a copy of it. But if I reverse it, reverse head, then Julia is yelling at me that I haven't put in one of the keyword arguments to this function reverse. So I specify that the dimension along which I want to reverse it is two. Then it knows to basically flip that top image uh, around, around the vertical axis. And you can read from here, you know, in the lower left quadrant, we've uh, flipped it around the other axis. And in the bottom right, we've kind of flipped it around both. And that gets us this nice, you know, multiple mirror image corgi thing. The point here, though, is just how nice it is to concatenate arrays. You know, we just have this open bracket, close bracket, and then we write things down kind of as you would write it in a math context, just this matrix with different elements in different spots. Now, what we really want, though, is to actually get into those pixels and start doing some interesting things with them. And there's maybe two ways that we might think about this. One is to modify the array itself very directly, and the other one would be to copy the array to create a new object that's going to look different in some way. So copying things is straightforward enough. We just call this function copy. And when I've called new fill is equal to a copy of head, that means we have a new variable, it's new data. If we start manipulating this new fill variable, it's not gonna change the underlying uh, data for fill, the thing that we originally pulled it out from. 
So the goal right now is going to be to basically just paint one of the corners of this some monochromatic color, like red. And there's two different ways that we could think about doing this. One is to create a double for loop, where I'm going to take all the indices i, ranging from 1 up to 100, and then all the very ones j, uh, from 1 up to 100. Or maybe I'll make that a different number, like 300, so we'll be able to more easily see uh, which index is affecting which dimension. And then after that, I will take my array, new fill, I will index into it at i, comma j, and I'm going to ask it to become red, where red is a thing that I've previously defined above, an RGB value that is just 100. 0, 0. Now you'll notice that unlike a lot of the other blocks, this one isn't showing us anything because for loops themselves don't return anything. So instead I would have to actively type new fill, and we'll see that new fill is indeed modified. And it looks like the j variable that was going from 1 to 300 is going along the horizontal direction. And that kind of makes sense, because the first thing that we do when we go into an array is go from top to bottom, and then the second thing is to start going inward. You might think of it as being painted like one of those old-style printers that kind of goes left to right, left to right, the way you would read a book or any kind of page. So that's nice, we've modified our image, but there's actually a much easier way if you want to just change all of those pixels to be red without going through the for loops to get into it. Um, and we can do what's known as broadcasting. So here what I'll do is create yet another fill, new fill 2, that's copying new fill itself. And then I'm going to slice into it where I'm going from the 100th pixel up to the 200th pixel. So that's going to be um, from the bottom of where we painted red down further. And then from the first up to the 100th, which you know goes only a third of the way in as the red rectangle did. And then I'm going to say dot equals RGB 010, which is basically saying it's all green and none of the other colors. And what this dot is doing is saying, hey, this operation I'm asking you to do, rather than doing it to the object itself that you see on the left, I want you to look into all the elements of this array and apply it to each one of them individually. So this is doing the same thing as the for loops that we had above, but syntactically it's a lot nicer to look at. This little dot idea of broadcasting across arrays is actually quite common in Julia, and you can do it with um, functions. It doesn't have to be assigning variables like this. And let me show you what I mean by that. Let's say I write some kind of function that I want to happen to each individual pixel. And in this case, I'm defining a function called redify, where redify is going to take in a variable. Maybe I'll give it a better name. I'll give it something like color. So it's going to take in a color, and then what it returns is a new RGB value where the red is pulled straight from color, color.r, and then it has no green and it has no blue. So basically it says, give me a pixel, I'm going to strip out its blue and green value, just keep its red value and give it back to you. So as an example, let's say I define some kind of color that has values 0 0.8, 0 0.5, and 0 0.2. So it's this nice sort of brownish value. Or maybe we rob it of some of its red and we get this sort of greenish value here. If I were to display um, an array that's, an, a list that's color, comma, redify color, what it's showing us is the original color and then what happens when we call redify to it. So um, no matter what color goes in, it's pulling out just the red part. Simple function, not something you would really use in practice, but the reason for defining it is to show you an example of what broadcasting can look like. Because let's say we take the array um, that is Philip himself, and we call redify.philip. What it's doing is it's applying this function across all of Philip. So if I didn't have that dot, if I just tried to call redify Philip, it's giving me this error. It's like type array has no field r. And the reason that it's doing that is because when you call the redify function, it thinks it's taking in a color, and the thing that it does with that color is called dot r, as if it was going to be of the appropriate type. Um, but it complains at us for that. Of course, if we broadcast it across all of the pixels of Philip, those are of the correct type. So when I do that, we see this very, you know, it's kind of like we're in one of those old school film development rooms and maybe there's this wet picture of the corgi just kind of hanging as it develops. But I would encourage you, if you're playing with things right now, to try defining your own function that might do something else to the color and then broadcasting across whatever image you want. If you're working with a really big image that makes things kind of slow and you want to just see what it looks like sped up, uh, one kind of nice tactic is to use this decimate function where if we call decimate on one of our arrays, it basically pulls out, um, in this case, I think it's pulling out every fifth element, but I could ask it to pull out something like every 10th and it's pulling out every 10th element. Or if I said pull out every, every other element, it pulls out every other. Uh, so it clearly decreases the quality. And as far as image compression goes, it's not the most sophisticated scheme, but it's a nice way to just take what was a large image and then make it a smaller image that looks roughly the same. But here, of course, it's of a poorer quality.
So if we asked for something like, hey, what's the size of poor Phil, this new variable I've defined, uh, we see it's notably smaller. And so from here, if we wanted a nice small image to work quickly with, we could have poor Phil, which is all well and good. For example, one of the uh, interesting things that we're going to get into, mostly in lecture two, but I want to give you a little preview of things today, is this idea of a convolution. Um, this is very common in image processing. It's basically a way that we can go through each pixel and do something to it based on the neighbors of that pixel. And again, we'll go over all of the math of that next time. But just as an initial preview, I'm calling a function called convolve. I'm inputting poor fill, the kind of decimated version of our puppy head. Um, and then I'm giving it this other thing called blur2. And if you were curious what blur2 is, you can just take a look at it. And we can see that it's a two by two array of floats. It's got certain values. And based on what we talk about in the next lecture, it'll maybe be clearer uh, why this does what it's about to do. But if I call this convolve function with the array and that blur2, it makes it a little bit blurrier. And that's a little bit clearer if I have more of a blur, like blur10. And if I were to look at the value of blur10, we see it's a much bigger array. Um, it's got a bunch of other values in there. And you might be able to guess at the moment that what this is doing is taking a kind of average of all of the pixels around a particular pixel. And by taking that average, it kind of uh, makes the picture look out of focus to us. So if it were only blur of one, we actually get the original image. Um, but then as you increase that value a little bit more, then it gets blurrier and blurrier. And this thing that I'm doing right here where I'm trying to change this variable and I'm changing it one at a time, um, at least while we're in the context of Pluto, we can do this in a, in a nicer way. We have these notion of uh, UI elements. So if we start using this library Pluto UI, then we can do things like creating a slider where I'm going to bind a variable called blur factor to a slider. And this slider is going to have values from one up to 20. I want to show what its value is. So right now it's showing us the one, but if I were to change it a little bit, it shows us another value. And now I can take that variable I can have the same line that we had before, which was convolving poor fill with blur according to some number that I'm putting into it. But here I can do it in a more interactive way, which is kind of nice. So again, if this is something that you're playing with, this makes it a nice way to just tweak the variables to see the effect that it has on you know whatever function you're coming to be familiar with. So right now, food for thought for anyone watching this is, I want you to think about exactly what blur is probably doing. Like I said, you know, it's taking each part of the image and it's changing it based on the neighbors around it. And this whole idea, which, you know, we can kind of write in pseudocode here, where each element of an image, you index into it at ij, you're doing something based on the neighborhood, that ends up being really powerful. Um, and if that something is simply an average or more sophisticated kind of average, you typically get a blurring effect. But we can do smarter things with it. And one of the things you're going to do in the first problem set is actually take that idea um, of just looking at a pixel and then looking at all of its neighbors and using that to try to pull out what the edges of that image actually are. So in this context, if I called a function which you are going to define um, called edge detect on poor fill, you know, it, it pulls out a lot of the little edges in there. And then one thing that you might play around with is what would happen if I smoothed out fill a little bit beforehand. So I might convolve poor fill with a blur maybe a blur of factor three. And it's yelling at me because of some invalid syntax, uh, premature input. So what am I doing here? Convolve, poor fill, blur of three. And then I'm plugging in the output of that to edge detect. Oh, I just don't have enough parentheses. Great. So if I take a smoothed version, it's finding fewer edges, which kind of makes sense because the smoother it is, uh, the fewer edges there are to be found. But that's all something that we're going to dig into a little bit more in detail in the next lecture. Before then, I would encourage you to start thinking about how this might work, right? How is it that you figure out what the edges are, especially if it's in a noisy environment? What can we do to try to overcome that noise? And again, edge detection is actually quite useful in a lot of scientific applications. You know, you take a picture of a bunch of cells and you want to know how many cells there are in there. And you want to do that in kind of an automated way. A classic first step would be to detect the edges to make it a simpler image. As we move forward, we're going to start doing some more sophisticated things with these, and uh, it's going to get good. I think you're going to enjoy where we're going with this.